On September 2nd, 1866, Hiram Johnson was born to Annie Day Monfredi and one-term representative, Grove Lawrence Johnson, joining four more siblings. After graduating from Hale College, he got a job as a shorthand reporter and a stenographer for law offices, eventually deciding to pursue a law degree. After attending UC Berkeley as a member of Chi Phi, he was admitted to the bar in 1888. Right before that, he got married to Minnie McNeil. After moving to San Francisco, he served as an assistant district attorney and started getting involved with progressive politics, particularly focusing on anti-corruption, becoming the lead prosecutor in the San Francisco GAF trials after the original one, Francis Henney, was shot in the jaw. Long story. Johnson ended up winning the case, which raised his profile amongst Californians, which was the perfect stepping stone to initiate a run for governor. Running with the Lincoln Roosevelt League, a prominent group of progressive Republicans that were primarily against the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. California being a deep red state at the time meant that it was a bit easy for Johnson to win. Upon being elected, Johnson set his sights on tackling the political and economic establishment with reforms fitting the eponymous era. He created a railroad commission to regulate the power of the SPR, but his forefront issues were tackling electoral reform. He instituted the ballot initiative referendum and recall into California's electoral system to make it more democratic. But the biggest accomplishment he did was that he stripped the California legislature from its ability to appoint U.S. senators and instead made it so that they were democratically elected by the people of the state, making California the most democratic state of the union. These reforms led to his profile becoming larger, leading to him becoming a national figure for progressive Republicans. His attention would grow even more so when he publicly supported Teddy Roosevelt's 1912 primary challenge to Taft. After the GOP basically turned away Roosevelt, Johnson became one of the leading figures to pressure Roosevelt to form a brand new political party, and Johnson was chosen to chair the convention to form this new party. After Roosevelt was unanimously chosen as their nominee, Johnson was chosen to be his running mate. Johnson's position as the well-liked Republican governor of California obviously gave him much influence in the California GOP, as well as the new California Progressive Party, basically leading to a sort of unofficial merger between the two groups. Well, it was more of a hostile takeover. Basically, it led to the California GOP deciding to nominate Roosevelt instead of Taft, effectively booting him off the ballot. After the 1912 electoral successes of the Progressive Party, they basically moved forth with a lot of other successes, many of which were in California, thanks to Hiram. In fact, he had grew the California progressive so much that when conservatives decided to nominate another conservative to boot Johnson off their ballot, Johnson still managed to win re-election with the progressives. In fact, Johnson had become so popular that the Progressive Party practically begged him to be their 1916 nominee after Roosevelt declined. However, Hiram would decline as well. Why is that? Well, he was like, hmm... Remember those progressive reforms I instituted as governor? Well, let me test them out. And he decided to run for Senate, winning both the Republican and progressive ballot lines easily and getting more than double the votes of his opponent. Once elected, he made himself well known as a non-interventionist to downright isolationist progressive, voting against the Sedition Act and war and such. However, 1919 would be a turning point for the progressive movement in America because Teddy Roosevelt had died and the Progressive Party was following suit. So they turned to Johnson one more time to be their torchbearer for the party going into the 1920 election. While he did decide to seek the presidency, he decided to do it as a Republican, thus killing any chance of the National Progressive Party surviving. And since the party fell apart, progressives were now divided on who they were going to support in 1920. While most of the primary voters backed Hiram, more nationwide progressive leaders and Roosevelt's family members backed Major General Leonard Wood, who was more of an internationalist progressive, much like Roosevelt. And if you're from Wisconsin, you backed Robert M. Follett. One backroom deal later, and none of them got the nomination. Though Johnson was apparently offered the chance to be the vice presidential nominee, but he turned it down. Two years later, he sought re-election, and again got double the votes of second place. Around that time, he was also a finalist to head the newly created Motion Pictures Producers and Distributors of America. After another two years, Hiram decided to launch another bid for the presidency, this time challenging incumbent president Calvin Coolidge, and Robert M. Follett followed suit. However, by this time, the GOP had garnered an immense hatred for the still prominent left wing of the party, and they basically did everything they could to try and prevent the left wing from taking over the party. Well, I mean, stop Hiram from taking over the party, because 
everybody knew that La Follette wasn't getting the nomination. He was already plotting for his third party bid, but Hiram, being a more nationwide figure and winning the previous primaries, showed that he had a chance. So Coolidge basically pulled out every single dirty trick in the book outside of flat out rigging the nomination. He used patronage to pressure incumbent Republicans to basically snub Hiram, who would have otherwise probably supported him. Heck, even some Coolidge supporters actually tried to get another guy named Hiram Johnson on the ballot in Michigan to confuse Hiram backers, who helped him win the state in 1920. Due to all this, Johnson's campaign was a lot less successful, only winning South Dakota. Afterwards, Hiram decided to mostly focus back on his job in Congress, passing his landmark bill, the Immigration Act of 1924, banning Asian immigrants from the United States. When 1928 rolled around, progressives again expected Johnson to try again for the presidency, but he decided, no, I'm going to focus on the Senate full time and won another term. And it wasn't until 1932 that he did something that was interesting, something that he hadn't done in 20 years. Support a non-Republican for the presidency, endorsing Franklin Roosevelt over incumbent President Herbert Hoover. Much like late teens, early 20s progressives, he has a thing for the Roosevelts. After Roosevelt won, he became FDR's favorite Republican by being a huge supporter of the New Deal programs. That actually made the 1934 California Democrats decide to give their nomination to Hiram when he sought another Senate term, making his only opposition candidate be the Socialist Party nominee. Not that long afterwards, he fully supported Roosevelt for a second term, but exactly one year later, Roosevelt decided to try and pack the court, which soured Johnson on Roosevelt, publicly supporting Wendell Wilkie's campaign while running for re-election with two minor party opposition candidates this time. During those latter FDR years, he was the official Republican candidate for President Pro Tempore. As Hiram got older and older, he started fading into the background before passing away on August 6, 1945 after a 30-year Senate tenure. Yes, the die-hard isolationist dies the day that the US decided to drop the nukes. If you're a religious member of my audience, maybe you think it's a sign. Johnson's tenure as a leading progressive leader should be recognized as much as other progressive figures we'd like even if modern day progressives might not like a lot of the positions Hiram took at the time, like I mean I'll fully admit, this anti-Asian immigration bill and him being anti-League of Nations was at the very least kind of misguided, but you can kind of understand at least one of the two things I stated, not the former, but the latter. But much like other political figures that have done some pretty bad things, the good can sometimes outweigh the bad, and in my view, Hiram kind of has that. He's done good things, he's done bad things, and he's not perfect, but that's just like every other political figure. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, check out my articles on the Independent Political Report, or consider supporting me on Patreon.